Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here. I'm Crystal Logan. I'm the Director of Community Programs here at the Aspen Institute. And we welcome you to this um, very special occasion. And we wish you a happy winter school. Our speaker, as you know, this evening is Steve Wicks. Many of, you don't, many of you know Steve, and you know that he's really a national treasure, isn't he? <laughs> the, nation, the nation just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> uh, during his tenure here at the Aspen Institute as the director of the Society of Fellows program, Steve accomplished what no other person has done in our 62-year history he created this excellent presentation that you're about to experience, which is really one of the best explanations of why the Aspen Institute and why Aspen itself are so significant and special. Steve has lived in Aspen for over 40 years. He's a pillar of our community. After graduating from the University of Colorado with a degree in communication, he returned to Aspen where he started a very successful business career that spanned over 30 years. He's an active community volunteer and nonprofit board member. He's married to the lovely Barbara Wicks, who we hope will be here soon. And uh, they have two fabulous children, Whit Whitney and, and Andrew. So thank you, Steve, for all that you've done to excavate our fascinating history and bring it to life for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal, and uh, really thanks to all of you for coming tonight. I'm a little overwhelmed by the audience. Um, I, I hope you're glad you're come when this is, it, when this is over. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be back here at the Institute. You know, I've given this talk uh, more than a few times before, uh, and no two are alike, and that is true also tonight, too. So I, I try to kind of uh, keep it up to date and customize it to the audience. By the way, all of the music that you hear during this presentation is music that was played just a few hundred yards from here in the original tent in 1949. Uh, as you were coming in, I don't know if any of you noticed, but we've been listening to Mendelssohn's overture, Calm Sea and Prosperous Voyage. So let me be among the first to say to you, Happy Winter School 2013. The theme this year is Vintage Spirit. I really have no idea what ACRA had in mind when they chose this, but I know what it means to me. It means to me that it's probably a good idea to pause and reflect every now and then on what the founders of modern day Aspen had in mind when they launched this voyage that we hopefully are still on in 2012. So I hope to give you just a taste of what happened here in 1949. And by taking a sip of vintage 1949, I hope to challenge you to ask yourself, how are we doing in terms of keeping the Aspen idea alive in 2012? Once again, thanks for being here this evening. It was about five years ago I became very, very interested, some might say obsessed, in what actually happened here in 1949. What was this Goethe bicentennial convocation? So what I'd like to share with you tonight is a little bit of my research. This three-week-long event was odd in several ways. First of all, the headliner, German poet and philosopher Johann von Goethe, had been dead for 117 years. The desired keynote speaker, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, was 74 years old and living in Africa. And by the way, he had never traveled to the United States previously. Even the Albert Schweitzer Foundation could not get him to come here for their own conferences. How many lodging rooms would you guess were available here in 1949? A generous estimate is about 100. And how many participants did they think was necessary to break even? About 4,000. <laughs> now this appears to be a savvy group here tonight, so I probably don't need to point out the final thing, but I will. This is 1949. World War II had only been over for four years, and we're planning a festival to celebrate high German culture? <laughs> what we do know about this event was that it gave birth to the Aspen Institute, 
the Aspen Music School, the Aspen Music Festival and School, and the concept of the Aspen Idea. This three-week event, I submit to you, marked the birth of Aspen, Colorado as we know it today. And yet, we know so little about it. I hope to prove to you this evening that the Goethe Convocation was an amazing, I might even call it magical, convergence. It was a wonderful convergence of a philosopher's birthday, a planet very much in need of repair, and a town very much ready for a renaissance. Why, I ask you, do you think more than 2,000 people came to Aspen in July of 1949? Was it really to celebrate a dead German poet? And what the heck was the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra doing in this dusty, gritty, very quiet town of Aspen, Colorado? I now invite you to sit back and get comfortable because over the next 50 minutes or so, you're going to become among the very few who know the answers to these three questions. Once again, this very music played here on Tuesday, July 5th, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Let's tackle the first question on the list. Why Goethe? Or more accurately, who's Goethe? Allow me to introduce you to this very interesting guy, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. If you learn nothing else this evening, I want you to be able to pronounce the name of this man who is key to modern Aspen. So here is my current trick for you to remember. Please say the word blur in English out loud, blur. Now say the same word, but go really light on that final R. Can you say bleu, bleu, all right? Remember that position of your chin with bleu, and now say Goethe. One more time. Use it three times in a sentence, and you'll, it'll be yours. Goethe was born in 1749, and thus, the 1949 Goethe Bicentennial Convocation was, in fact, a 200th birthday party for Johann. He was not here. That's the first myth we're going to dispel this evening. Goethe was born in 1749 to well-to-do parents. His father was an attorney, and his mother's father was the mayor of Frankfurt. Thanks to private tutors, he read works by all the significant German, English, and French authors. He read Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, and this was just an elementary school. I'm using a modern map of Germany here, just so you have a point of reference. Keep in mind that there was not a Germany in, in 1749. Frankfurt was an imperial free city of the Holy Roman Empire at that time, but that is a whole other slideshow. At age 16, Goethe began attending the University of Leipzig, where his father attended to study law. In a lovely bit of irony, Goethe, who would go on to be considered one of the greatest humanists of the 19th century, found his humanities classes boring and frustrating. At age 20, Goethe transferred to the University of Strasbourg, which was a much better fit, as we say of college students nowadays. He attended lectures on medicine and political theory. He delved into historical, philosophical, and theological questions. Goethe had mixed feelings about the value of a university education, a sentiment that would be echoed 200 years later in Aspen by the president of the University of Chicago. But I'm getting ahead of my show already. Goethe pretended to practice law for the next four years in and around Frankfurt. But what, what he really did was translate and write. In 1774, he published a book which would earn good to the title of the first author in history to write a best-selling novel. In 1775, the best-selling author was invited to move to Weimar by Duke Karl August. Now keep in mind, still, there was no Germany at this time. Weimar was a grand duchy, essentially an independent country ruled by a long line of dukes. Karl August, who invited him there to be his buddy, was the 11th and last duke ruling Weimar for over 300 years. Goethe got there just in time. Goethe remained in Weimar for the next 57 years until his death in 1832. Well, actually, he remained in Weimar for the next 57 years with the exception of a two-year allegedly sensual and life-changing visit to Italy in 1786. Goethe's diaries in this period form the basis of the nonfiction 
Italian Journey. In the decades which followed its publication, Italian Journey inspired countless German youths to follow Goethe's example. So as I said, Goethe remained in Weimar for the next 57 years, where he held a succession of offices, becoming the Duke's chief advisor and confidant. The law school student, whose dissertation received a failing grade, served on the Supreme Court of Weimar for many years. And here's the little book which turned Goethe from an unknown into a celebrated author practically overnight. More than a little autobiographical, this novel is about a young and romantic young man who meets and falls in love with a sweet-natured woman who inconveniently is engaged to another man. He's unable to subdue his passion, and his infatuation torments him to the point of absolute despair. It's appropriate to say that Goethe was a prolific writer. He wrote novels, poems. He wrote plays in the style of Shakespeare in his 20s. And if you're considering of purchasing a set of the complete works of Goethe, you can. A recent edition fills more than 45 volumes, each one of those volumes having five or six uh, different entities in it. Goethe was also an insatiable reader. Starting in his youth, he read works by all the significant German and French authors, as I mentioned earlier. Later in life, he made a systematic study of the literature of other nations, including China and India. He translated books and poems into German from Italian, Spanish, Croatian, Finnish, and modern Greek. Goethe was much more than just a writer, however. Initially invited to be the young Duke's close personal friend, the general court wit, and the organizer of, of court theatricals, over the next 57 years, he was also a lawyer, a diplomat, a scientist, a mining engineer, and for a short time, a reluctant military leader. Because Goethe was a friend of the Duke, some may say he had a cushy civil service job for 57 years, but actually you should know he was a bit of a workaholic. He used to get up four hours before everyone else to work on his writing and research. In 1790, he published a book on plant morphology. Speaker rule number one, turn cell phone off. Uh, Charles Darwin used this book 50 years later. In 1810, Goethe published his book, The Theory of Colors, which he considered his most important work. As a matter of fact, he thought he would be most remembered for his work on color theory. Unfortunately, some of the specifics of his color theory were just wrong. But uh, his novel approach to the science of study, uh, the study of science, led to, among other things, the Waldorf system of education. Rudolf Steiner derived his theory of knowledge from Goethe. In his book, Goethean Knowledge, Steiner wrote, thinking is no more and no less an organ of perception than the eye or ear. Just as the eye perceives colors and the ear sounds, so thinking perceives ideas. In fact, Johann Goethe was accomplished in so many areas of study that many refer to him as one of the greatest polymaths in history. Some refer to him as the last living polymath. As a result of this presentation, if you learn nothing else, I want you to stop saying that the 1949 convocation was about celebrating a dead German poet. No, the Goethe convocation was about celebrating a dead German polymath. Here's a timeline with some other well-known polymaths. Maybe a little small to, small to read. Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, Isaac Newton. Note how Thomas Jefferson and Johann Goethe were almost perfect contemporaries. Never met, however. Some say that Albert Schweitzer was a polymath. More about him later. Of course, there have been other polymaths throughout history and throughout the world. It's not like Western Europe and America have had the corner on the market of polymaths. So I guess the organizers could have chosen Abbas, Ibn, or Abu as the featured polymath in Aspen 1949, but they didn't. Here's, here's Goethe's probably best known work. Um, this is Faust. It took him over 60 years to write. Um, probably the most famous work. It's a closet drama, meaning it's meant uh, to be read and not to be performed. It's an extremely complicated work. Uh, Goethe spent 60 years writing it. But here are the cliff notes of the cliff notes uh, for Faust. Dr. Faust makes a deal with the devil. If he, Dr. Faust, can experience one moment of complete happiness, a moment where he is so happy 
that he says, that's it. I'm perfectly happy and can't think of being any happier than the devil may have my soul. Well, there's a surprise ending to this book. I won't spoil it for you because I know many of you are going to go out and read it uh, immediately after this presentation. Not all of Goethe's work is dark and difficult to understand, I want to let you know. Uh, certainly, almost everyone in this room has heard of his poem, Der Zauberlehrling. Yes? It's a poem concerning what happens when you summon help, and then the solution itself turns into a bigger problem. Perhaps this will help you remember the Goethe poem. The music is not by Goethe, it's by Paul Dukas, and yes, this was played here in 1949. The line you see at the bottom, Die rief die Geister, werde ich nicht nun los, has been garbled into a very famous German phrase now, Die Geister, die ich rief, which is to say, the spirits that I've called, how do I get rid of them? It's often used to describe a situation where somebody summons help or uses allies that he cannot control afterwards. So what conclusions might you have come to if you, like Goethe, had been born into a wealthy family who could afford private tutors to teach you the classics in elementary school? If you, and I'm sure many of you do, have the sort of work ethic that meant you rose four hours before everyone else to read, study, and write? If you had been a thoughtful philosopher for a few years before the Industrial Revolution and for several years after, what conclusions might you have come to if, like Goethe, you had lived at a time when it was still possible to become a polymath? That is to say, a time when you could digest all the cumulative wisdom of the ages without getting indigestion. What conclusions might you come to after a life of reading all the greatest works of the Western world, India, and the Orient? You might, as Goethe did, come to the conclusion that human beings, regardless of nationality and regardless of the century in which they had li lived, are pretty much concerned about the same things. The 1949 con uh, Goethe Convocation has a program book. Many of you have seen the oft-reprinted quote, which says this, the difficulty of our time is a difficulty of the human spirit. But how many of you have read the last paragraph recently? It gives one of the more succinct answers to my question, why Goethe? And it said, if man is somehow one, and if the world is somehow one, it is not too soon to wonder what it is that unifies both man and world. Keep in mind that Goethe lived almost exactly during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Armed with the wisdom of the ages, he was a little worried about the future of civilization. He foresaw a few problems, including the press. Anticipating the growth of journalism in coming decades, he spoke of these dreadful times of a niggling and divisive press, which brings a sort of semi-culture to the masses. He discussed the dangers of the spread of machines, which, like a thunderstorm, are slowly, slowly surging forth, which will come and strike. He complained about the restlessness of the younger generation. Everything nowadays is ultra, he wrote. No one knows himself anymore. No one understands the material with which he is working. Wealth and speed are what the world admires and are aspired to by all. Railways, mail coaches, steamships, and all possible means of communication those in the civilized world try to outdo each other in producing these things and thereby go on to persist in mediocrity. So I've collected for you three basic messages from Goethe to save you 60 years of reading and studying. First of all, we are one world. Even our literature, with all its different forms and flavors, contains the same basic themes. Secondly, the importance of educating the whole person at first, you might think that this is in contradiction to number one. If we truly want to become one planet, one humanity, shouldn't we all just put on the same uniform and follow one charismatic leader? Absolutely not. The goal of life, according to Goethe, is to develop through individuality to universality. And number three, attention. Pause and reflect. Goethe cautions us that as we learn with the story of Faust, Completing the journey through individuality to universality is not easy, thanks to basic human nature. And due to the difficulty of this journey, one must take care to nourish the body, the mind, and the spirit along the way. 
As I will discuss in a few minutes, the organizers of the 1949 Goethe Bicentennial clearly had these three very Goethean messages in mind at the earliest stages of planning. Let's change now to why 1949. In 1949, we had cars, we had planes, we had the atomic bomb, and we were all about to get television. But how are we doing in 1949? In terms of human dignity, not so good. How are we doing recently in terms of runaway nationalism? Not so good. How are we doing in terms of treating each other as equals? How are we doing in terms of racism? Not so good. And then there was this chap on the international stage. After two decades of civil war, Mao Zedong announced the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Mao wrote, there is such a thing as a healthy personality cult, that is to worship men like Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, because they hold the truth in their hands. Not exactly Goethe in his approach to putting personal development ahead of allegiance to the state. And how are we doing in terms of knowing how to deal with the spirits that we called to help us? Ah, the spirits I've called. Now, how to get rid of them. To truly understand the roots of the Goethe Convocation, you have to know a little bit about this fellow, Robert Hutchins, who was the chair of the Goethe Bicentennial Foundation, formed just for this purpose. So why was Hutchins on the cover of Time magazine in November of 1949? He was on the cover of Time because of his early successes in advocating for nothing short of a complete reinvention of education in America. In Hutchins' opinion, American universities were not doing a very good job of educating the whole person. Another reason he was on the cover of Time was because he was president of the foundation that had just put on a very unusual festival four months earlier in a very unusual place. You guessed it. Aspen, Colorado. The 1949 Goethe Festival in Aspen was put on by the Goethe Bicentennial Foundation, formed just for that purpose. The foundation consisted of 45 directors, including its honorary chairman, former President Herbert Hoover. Of course, as with most com uh, committees you've served on, the work was done by two individuals, Foundation President Robert Hutchins and Foundation Vice President Walter Pepke. But this was not the first time that Hutchins was on the cover of Time magazine. In 1929, the nation gasped, according to Time, when the trustees of that venerable institution, the University of Chicago, named a 30-year-old to be its next president. Now keep in mind this cover was in 1935, already six years into his presidency. Just imagine how young he looked at 1929. One of the reasons he was on the cover in 1935 was because he had just delivered in a graduation address an eloquent rebuttal to those who feared that the looming specter of communism was a good reason to limit free speech. Shortly after arriving at the university, Hutchins made an unlikely appointment. He recruited a brilliant, brazen, and somewhat diminutive instructor of philosophy from Columbia, Mortimer Adler. Hutchins was tall, handsome, brilliant, witty, and often self-deprecating. I'm the president of a great university, Hutchins confessed to Adler one day at lunch, but I haven't thought much about education. Me either, said Mortimer. I'm a philosopher. Hutchins said his own education at that point consisted only of a little knowledge of the Bible, Plato, Shakespeare, Goethe, and in the opinions of some judges from law school. Adler chuckled and told him that if he didn't do something drastic fast, the university of president would likely close his educational career a wholly uneducated man. Of course, as many of you know, uh, it was Adler, Hutchins, and Walter Pepke who went on to create the seminar-based Great Books program. Once again, a whole other slideshow. Hutchins examined US education and flatly declared it aimless. He lambasted the US University for trying to be too many things that it should not be, an athletic establishment, a health resort, a vocational school, and a place to acquire the social graces. When young people are asked, what are you interested in? They answer that they are interested in justice. They want justice for the Negro. They want justice for the third world. But if you say, well, what is justice? They haven't any idea. After biding his time for one year, the new university president turned the University of Chicago upside down with his new plan. 
At one stroke, he wiped out the whole conventional university structure and paraphernalia. Students could enroll without a high school diploma and without an entrance exam. The normal rules for mandatory attendance were abolished. The undergraduate college flourished as never before, attracting rising numbers of inquisitive, self-motivated students. Enrollment went from 1,700 to 2,700 in four years. There are two ways to have a great university, said Hutchins. It must either have a great football team or a great president. In 1939, intercollegiate football vanished from the University of Chicago. Another myth I sometimes hear, and you've probably heard too, is that the purpose of the 1949 Goethe Convocation was to redeem the good name of the German people after World War II. Well, an examination of who planned the convocation and why clearly exposes this myth as just that, a myth. In fact, I submit to you that Goethe would roll over in his grave should he hear this myth about a convocation based on nationalism. It was at the University of Chicago that the idea for the Goethe, Convo the Goethe Convocation was born. In 1947, a group of scholars, including professors from Cornell, Yale, and Arnold Bergstresser from the University of Chicago, proposed having a convocation to celebrate the 200th birthday of Johann von Goethe. It was to be a conventional academic celebration featuring lectures and, oh yes, uh, Bergstrasser uh, would celebrate a new edition of Goethe's works, which he was in the process of preparing. Well, Bergstrasser mentioned his idea to his colleague at the University of Chicago, Giuseppe Borghese. Borghese, an intense Sicilian with burning deep-set eyes and fiercely emphatic opinions, had been forced to flee Italy for criticizing Benedict uh, Benito Mussolini. As much as Borghese admired Goethe, his passion was for forming one worldwide government. He saw a Goethe celebration as a perfect vehicle for promoting this concept. Remembering that his boss, now Chancellor Hutchins, uh, was fond of Goethe, Borghese brought the idea to Hutchins. Like Borghese, Hutchins was involved in drafting a new single world constitution. Hutchins also had never lost his fervor for reinventing university education in America. All three were in agreement that a Goethe convocation was a good idea. They were also in agreement that it should not be held at a university or in a large city. A convocation of this importance should last two to three weeks for total immersion. It should take some place out of the way. And if it was hard to get to, that would be even better. And of course, Goethe would want it to be a beautiful place. But where? Where? On February 21st, 1947, Robert Hutchins invited a member of the Board of Trustees and his personal friend, Walter Pepke, to lunch. Let's ask Walter, he thought. Walter always has good ideas. Well, in a, good, in a few slides, we will come back to Walter's frame of mind at that luncheon with Robert Hutchins. But first, let's talk about Aspen in the 10 years leading up to the Goethe, Con Goethe Convocation. So Aspen, Colorado in 1949, what was the elevation? 7,890 feet, right? What was the population? Best estimate is about 700. So you know, today in 2013, Aspen seems like a perfectly logical place to host the Idea Aspen Ideas Festival and a Ralph Lauren store pictured here. But let's travel back in time and imagine Aspen as it might have looked to Walter and his wife, Elizabeth Pepke. It's actually Elizabeth who was first to come to Aspen. She was, uh, uh, Walter and Elizabeth had owned a, uh, a farm near Castle Rock and uh, not one of his better investments, and, and Walter hated to lose money. The Pepkes tried a half a dozen ways of turning a profit down there, including dude ranching, breeding of pedigree hounds, thoroughbred stallions, Clydesdale mares, and finally, they attempted raising turkeys. Well, it was in the winter of 1939 where they had house guests on their ranch. The pipes froze, and Elizabeth suggested to their house guests, why don't we go skiing in Aspen? And they said, really? <laughs> What's skiing, and where's Aspen? Well, they left Walter at home to deal with the pipes, and Elizabeth brought her house guests to Aspen, and they stayed at some of the very few homes that were inhabited, some of the few rooms that were inhabitable at the Hotel Jerome at that time. What did they do? They stayed at the Jerome. How did you ski? 
Well, you got up and had breakfast with the miners at 6 a.m., and then you rode the truck up to the midnight mine, and then you climbed from there to the top of Aspen Mountain. At the top, we halted in frozen admiration, Elizabeth Pepka wrote in a memoir. In all that landscape of rock, snow, and ice, there was neither print of animal nor track of man. We were alone, as though the world had just been created, and we its inhabitants. Well, despite the glowing reports from Elizabeth about Aspen, it was not for six years over Memorial Day weekend in 1945 that Walter actually visited Aspen, and Walter liked what he saw. On two successive mornings, Walter arose before his wife and their guests, wandered around Aspen, and met with Judge Shaw. By lunch on the second day, he had his sights set on half a dozen different homes and hundreds of lots. He had agreed to buy the Collins Block, now the home of the Caribou Club, then the home to Aspen's only hardware store slash mortuary. Also, he had purchased his first home, the Lamb House, on Triangle Park. He came back to the Hotel Jerome where Elizabeth had, was having lunch and proudly announced his find. And instead of the delighted cheers he'd expected, Elizabeth burst into tears. Not another house to run, she cried. She saw Walter setting off on yet another real estate adventure, leading her where she dared not think. By the end of 1946, just a year and a half later, Walter had invested over $200,000 in Aspen, buying homes, lots, commercial buildings, and renovating the Hotel Jerome. Now, when Walter first visited in Aspen in 1945, skiing had started, sort of. Aspen Mountain had two ski runs. We had Roach Run and we had the Silver Queen, both expert runs, both served by a rope tow that was built in 1938 and both, by today's definition, double black diamonds. National ski races were held here in 1941, but it was obvious that it was going to be, a difficult, that it was going to be difficult to obtain sufficient investment to continue to grow the resort. It was sort of a chicken and an egg dilemma. No one in his right mind would invest in Aspen Mountain as there was a scarcity of rooms for winter visitors. And no one in his right mind would build visitor accommodations if there was no beginning or even intermediate way to ski on Aspen Mountain. Walter Pepka, among other things, was a fast worker and quite adept at raising capital. Lift One opened to the public on January 11th, 1947. That would mean in two days it's celebrating its 66th anniversary. So this is only a year and a half after Walter's first visit Aspen now boasted having the world's longest chairlift. Actually, as many of you know, it was two chairlifts, but we won't let the facts get in the way of a good story. By the way, who's standing just to Walter's right? Um, the one on the sunglasses off his right shoulder. That would be Herbert Beyer. But again, a whole other slideshow for another time. Pepka appreciated the value of adding recreation to his dreams and plans in Aspen. If nothing else, skiing would help keep the hotel rooms filled in the winter, in between fabulous summers of cultural events. And now, back to that fateful lunch meeting on February 21st, 1947, when Robert Hutchins asked Walter if he knew of a good place to hold the Goethe Bicentennial Convocation. Somewhere remote, slightly hard to get to, and to be true to Goethe, somewhere fairly pretty. We can only imagine Walter's response. However, a few issues remain in terms of hosting an international conference in Aspen. In order to keep ticket prices reasonable, the festival organizers wanted a hall that could seat 1,500 people. Walter quickly called his contacts in Aspen and asked how many people could be seated in the Wheeler Opera House. About 650, Walter was told, but there was another problem. The Opera House had been gutted by a suspicious fire in 1912, and not much had been done to the Wheeler since then. In fact, there was no roof on the Wheeler in 1949, and it often rains in July. Someone mentioned to Walter that there was a lot of surplus canvas lying around after World War II. Perhaps he could erect some sort of circus tent on the edge of town for this one-time affair. Walter liked this idea. He turned for advice to the first place that came to mind, the Chicago Institute of Design. Walter was the chairman of the board. Did I mention that Pepka almost single-handedly saved the Bauhaus School of Architecture from extinction and merged it with the Chicago Institute of Design after the Bauhaus was forced to leave Germany? 
that's another slideshow. Well, one thing led to another, and Walter arranged for a young architect named Aero Saarinen to design an inexpensive but functional tent in the west end of Aspen. Of course, when the 39-year-old architect arrived in Aspen to inspect the site in 1949, he had not yet designed the TWA building at JFK Airport, nor had he designed Dulles Airport, he designed the whole thing, nor had he yet designed the St. Louis Arch. Well, it was decided that a tent in a meadow just west of Aspen would serve the purposes needed for lectures and music during the Goethe Convocation. Pepka figured that for the type of tent he had in mind, kind of a concrete bowl with a tent over it, a budget of six to $12,000 should be ample. And this is essentially how the uh, first tent was built. Uh, notice the very intimate stage kind of jutting out into the seats. Also notice the shrub shrubbery at the uh, point of the stage. There are very few color photographs from the Goethe Convocation. I'm still in search of a good one if you happen to have one. But they, the shrubbery was there for all the concerts and the lectures. So with a starting budget of six to $12,000, when Walter saw the soaring design for the new tent in the west end of Aspen, he was pleased. And it's a good thing he was pleased. The price tag, $57,000, not including seat pads, orchestra chairs, and restrooms exclusively for the musicians. Now, there are a few other problems using Aspen as a venue for an international convocation. This is actually a picture of our airport, not from 1949, but from the 60s, the earliest one I could find. Festival organizers came to Walter over and over again with, with expensive requests, so he was not surprised when they came to him in late 1947 and said, Walter, one more thing. And he's like, oh yeah, what's that? We think a convocation like this needs an airport. Well, it seems the construction projects progressed a little faster in 1949 than they do in 2013. Construction began in October 1948 on an unpaved runway. The first plane landed in November, and the Aspen Airport officially opened on December 19, 1948, with charter service from Glenwood, Grand Junction, and Denver. Now that you know a little bit about why the strange, a little bit why Aspen had this strange convocation in the summer of 1949, let's talk for a moment about the convocation itself. Who came, and what were they discussing? Well, they were doing some heavy lifting in that billowing new tent. They were talking about saving civilization from itself. Using Goethe as a common denominator, they were affirming the worth, dignity, and autonomy of the individual and the right of every human being to the greatest possible freedom. If you were sitting in the tent waiting for the day's music and lectures to begin, you would have read this in the program book. This is from the foreword. We are not gathered here in an antiquarian or academic mood still less sentimental. We are gathered here to search out in ourselves the depths of the spirit that sustained the optimism of Goethe. For if he had reason to be optimistic, we, in 1949, have need. Who came? As I mentioned earlier, 2,000 people came. They came from every state except two. The audience was an odd mix of philosophers, artists, and music lovers cutting-edge advocates for cultural reform, professors well-versed in the wisdom of the ages, along with many local town folks, both curious and tentative. Where was this going? Where did all these folks stay? Not at the Aspen Meadows Resort, not at the Gant, the Aspen Square, the Little Nell. Many were actually house guests. Most stayed in Glenwood Springs and were bussed up and down Valley every day. Some things never change. Who spoke and what was discussed? 30 speakers came, representing more than 11 countries. They wanted this to be an international conference, and it truly was. For the three weeks of the convocation, the business people, artists, intellectuals, poets, and musicians played their music, recited their poems, read their dissertations, and debated philosophy, not only at the tent, but also at the Pepka's home, which is what we know as Pioneer Park today. They debated philosophy by the Hotel Jerome swimming pool, and of course, at the Hotel Jerome Bar. Just like today's Ideas Festivals, 1949 had its headliner. This man, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, 
closed week one with a speech in French, and opened week two with the very same speech, but this time in German. Schweitzer was 74 years old in 1949, and although he labored for over a month perfecting his talk for Aspen, it was not Schweitzer's words and accomplishment that moved people, according to the Aspen Times, but his image as a mound of profound simplicity, inviolable conscience, and supreme self-sacrifice. In 1949, Schweitzer was actually best known as a scholar of Bach's music and as a concert organist. However, it wasn't long, three years later, that he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Schweitzer and his wife stayed with the Pepkas in their home at Pioneer Park. Here he is playing some Bach in their living room. The same piano, by the way, is in the Stollard House Aspen Historical Society Museum. The cover story in Time Magazine during the Goethe Convocation was about Schweitzer and his attendance at an unusual convocation in a forgotten Colorado town named Aspen. Well, two weeks later, the convocation didn't make the cover of life. Uh, no, in a wonderful Goethean irony, the cover story was about America's fascination with plastic boats at the beach. <clears throat> But an extensive story inside Life magazine uh, was featured inside. The Goethe Convocation has had many long-lasting effects, not the least of which is that suddenly, in 1949, Aspen, Colorado was on the map. Allow me to introduce, or reintroduce for some of you, this gentleman, Jose Ortega y Gasset, a Spanish philosopher and professor. Ortega y Gasset was forced to flee Spain during the Spanish Civil War due to the founding of an authoritarian state led by General Francisco Franco. A generally affable person, he was said to be always smiling as he walked around Aspen and enthusiastically greeted strangers. But when it came to warning the world about what happens when man gives up his individuality, Ortega y Gasset had experience in a, storm, a stern warning. Ortega described mass culture as outwardly dominated by fashionable hedonism and the cults of youth and entertainment spoiled by abundance and pleasure, brutalized by the barbarism of specialization, numbed by self-satisfaction and frivolity, the masked man knows nothing beyond himself and therefore incapable of discipline, self-sacrifice, and genuine excellence. Hence, he exchanges a demanding culture for a cheap anti-intellectualism and for a psychologically easy political authoritarianism like that of fascism and communism. And from there, civilization staggers to its doom. Ortega traveled to Aspen from Portugal, where he was still living in 1949. He never returned to Aspen, but he was one of the most prominent speakers of the convocation. And in fact, he played a key role in the formation of the Aspen Institute. More about that later. Here's another speaker with firsthand experience with the loss of individual rights, Giuseppe Borghese. Who, who you'll remember was forced to flee Italy for criticizing Benito Mussolini's fascist government. His Latin enthusiasm was infectious, reported the Aspen Times. As one audience member stated as she left the tent, it makes you want to start studying all over again. Borghese, you'll remember, was the one who saw the Goethe Convocation as a way to advance the cause of having one worldwide constitution. He must have been especially pleased on the last day of the convocation when every speaker present signed as a resolution calling for the formation of a World Council on International Relations to continue the work pioneered at these sessions. Applause resounded through the tent. And here's your new acquaintance, Robert Hutchins. July 16th was the closing day of the convocation. Robert Hutchins was the last speaker on the program. His talk was titled, Goethe and the Unity of Mankind. His speech was 30 pages long. I estimate he spoke for almost an hour. I'm striving to be more brief. The audience paid rapt attention, as you are. In his talk, Hutchins attempted to draw together the threads that had run through the 20-day convocation. In one good Goethean world, he said, the means of communication and transportation would not be used to send bombs, spies, propaganda, and messengers of misguided interest from one country to another, but to exchange students professors, ideas, and books, and to develop a supranational community founded on the humanity 
of the whole human race. On the topic of industrialization, Hutchins reminded the audience that Goethe was repelled by the rising industrial system of his day because it was anonymous, impersonal, and non-human. The individual caught in the economic machine without control over his own destiny, without satisfaction of being able to identify the product of his own labor, and without the opportunity of making the most of his individual self could not be said, in Goethe's view, to be leading a human life. And of course, one would be disappointed if Hutchins did not pummel our educational system one more time, and he did not disappoint. Criticizing universities for turning out specialists, Hutchins said, the greatest menace to our civilization is the menace of the uneducated expert. The uneducated expert. He commands respect because he's an expert, yet he knows nothing of other fields and nothing of the relationship of his field to them. He is therefore, outside his own fields, no better than an idiot child. The arts, Hutchins complained, are regarded as decorative but insignificant. It is not necessary to know anything about art if you know what you like, he quipped in jest. In 1949, Hutchins was very concerned with something he called the twin dangers of the atomic age. Our rapidly expanding knowledge has supplied us with the means of exterminating each other with an effectiveness and dispatch never dreamed of by our ignorant ancestors. It has provided us with means of communication that enable us to insult each other across national boundaries with a speed and volume unknown in a less enlightened day. What would he say today about the internet? The first risk of the atomic age, according to Hutchins, is that we would be blown up. The second risk is a little less obvious, but it was very much on the minds of this impatient educational reformer. The second risk, risk of the atomic age is that we will all die of boredom. The most unexpected characteristic of our time, Hutchins said, is the universal trivialization of life. Our rapidly expanding knowledge has provided us with time and it has turned out to be time to waste. The leisure that we now enjoy is in a sense the greatest achievement of the human race. And all the work mankind has put forth through countless ages to ease the path of generations yet unborn, all this work has ended up what? In Coney Island. Who played? Who sang during the convocation? Walter, in addition to being vice president of the convocation committee, was also in charge of music. Rejecting the Denver Symphony as too expensive for $8,800 for five days, Pepka instead contracted with the Minneapolis Symphony for $32,500 for 10 days, largely because of its famed conductor, Dimitri Metropolis. Metropolis was just finishing up 12 years with the Minneapolis Symphony. Later in this year, 1949, he moved to the New York Philharmonic. 75 musicians and their instruments traveled by train to Aspen. With or without music, Goethe's poetry was musical. He was a master craftsman of the German language. Of course, there have been many musicians who couldn't resist setting his poems to music. In fact, no poet in history has had more lyrics set to music. Schubert, Schumann, Beethoven, Liszt, to name a few. Now we turn to the sing-along portion of this program. Let's talk about some of the results of the 1949 convocation. By the fall of 1949, after considering a great outpouring of positive feedback, feedback from speakers and participants alike, Walter and Elizabeth made a decision that the best way to repeat the magic that had happened in the summer of 1949 was to open a university. Legal documents were filed and Aspen University was incorporated on December 8, 1949. But on October 26th of 49, Walter received a letter from Jose Ortega y Gasset that would change the course of history in Aspen. Pepke had shared with Ortega y Gasset his idea for university in Aspen and asked for Ortega's opinion. Ortega's letter, all 4,000 words of it, was so moving and persuasive 
that Walter immediately had it translated and mailed out to everyone associated with uh, the convocation. Even Ortega had to admit that something very special had happened while he was in Aspen. He wrote, I abandoned myself entirely to Aspen during those two wonderful weeks I spent there. That is, I absorbed that atmosphere to the very marrow of my bones. And one day, there appeared to me suddenly and altogether, along with many other subjects, the ideas I shall now succinctly expound. Succinctly in 4,000 words, of course. Aspen seemed to call, he said, for something like a university, but not a university as such. Rather, a most novel institution embodying only the nuclear meeting of a university. That is, advanced studies and education without the extraneous connotations of complicated organization and formal certification. So, the end of Aspen University was December 30th, 1949, and incorporation papers uh, for the Aspen University were changed to the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies on December 30th, 1949. Even before the 1949 event was over, Walter became the lightning rod for a wide variety of ideas. One thing was certain. Something very special happened in Aspen in 1949, and whatever that something was, it had to be identified and repeated. Eero Saarinen wrote to Walter Pepke, I want to congratulate you for an intellectual Mardi Gras, which, if you can see your way clear to repeat it, will have far-reaching consequences on the cultural life of our country. The Library of Congress requested recordings because, in their words, such a gathering of distinguished scholars is so rare as to be an important landmark in our cultural development. Equally important, a housewife from Boise, Idaho, sent Walter a four stanza poem. She said it was an appreciation of a 10-day period which gave me the deepest and finest experience of my life. One correspondent offered to supply Robert Hutchins with a list of every important birthday going back to the time of Christ, thereby keeping Aspen uh, in annual birthday celebrations for the next 2,000 years. <laughs> Beethoven, also a contemporary of Goethe, was thrilled when he was asked to put this poem to music. And so now that we know a little more about what was on Johann Goethe's mind and what was on the world's collective mind in 1949 and what was on the minds of the organizers of the 1949 Goethe Convocation, I'd like to take the last couple minutes to explore a deeper understanding of the term, the Aspen idea. When I began my research over four years ago, my primary goal was to understand what really happened here in 1949. What was on the minds of the organizers? What was it about this 20-day event in a tent that changed the course of Aspen history forever. And of course, like any good explorer, I was also hoping to find the Holy Grail, the Fountain of Youth, or at least a giant nugget of pure silver. I wanted to find out the source of the Aspen idea. Who first uttered that phrase? What was said, and most importantly, what is meant by the term, the Aspen idea? At this point in my research, I'm here to report that I cannot tell you who first uttered the term, what was said, nor what was meant. And perhaps this is good and right, like all great ideas. Perhaps this idea is best served by not having it have a singular date of birth and not having a singular definition. Meanwhile, though, we all feel free to invoke the Aspen idea. I've seen it in real estate ads. I've heard it referenced multiple times at city council meetings. When you land at Sardi Field and enter the concourse, you are created by a giant mural with the words mind, body, and spirit. I submit to you that it is time to do a little work to revisit what was originally meant by the Aspen idea. I submit to you that there is something very rich buried in this idea, and that the mindless overuse of these words is, well, a shame. Remember Robert Hutchins' warning that the most unexpected characteristic of our time is the trivialization of life? And thus, I live in constant fear that with all this careless overuse, one of our local ice cream shops will name their newest flavor 
the Aspen idea. Do you think there's something about the Aspen idea that has to do with this geographic, geological spot on the globe? This man does, or did. Thornton Wilder, an American playwright and novelist, attended the convocation. He began his talk with one of my questions, why Aspen? Why has this company been assembled in a village in the Rocky Mountains to learn what it can from reviewing the life and work of Goethe? His answer, here, on all sides, we are reminded of Goethe. Here are the mountain peaks of Prometheus and roadside flowers. Here are torrent and stream. Here, visible to us, as they could not be above a lighted city, are the great stretches of sky and the laps of the constellations. Here, with particular advantage, we may strive to follow Goethe, trying to grasp his doctrine of the unity of all living things. Where life and death and art and nature and the crystal in the mountain and the aspen tree and the home beside the road and Mozart's C major symphony all proceed from the shaping force at the heart of the universe. In closing, I'm going to turn again to the message of Robert Hutchins in his closing address. For Goethe, men are united not only to all other humanity alive on this planet right now, but also to those who lived before us and to those who will come after us. We are all links in the chain that connects the past with the future. This tradition transmits to us the aspirations of our ancestors and inspires us to struggle forward in our turn. Of course, the concept behind the Aspen idea is hardly new. One could even argue that it is the final conclusion of the most enlightened philosophers and spiritual leaders. However, given the fact that there may not be one definitive written explanation of the Aspen idea, it turns out that it is carried mostly in the hearts and the minds of those who live here and visit here and attend talks like this. That's why I'm so appreciative that you all took the time to come tonight. Let's take a few Goethean moments, pause and reflect on a more thorough understanding of the Aspen idea. I suggest that to fully explain the Aspen idea, our current fragment of an idea needs a preface and an appendix. First, the preface. Humanism features an optimistic attitude about the, ca the capacity of people but it does not involve believing that human nature is purely good or that all people can live up to it. If anything, there's the recognition that living up to one's potential is hard work and requires the assistance of others. And my suggested appendix. Human flourishing. Making life better for all humans. I hope you've enjoyed this re reminder sip of where we came from and how important it is to protect the place we all love. You've really been a very attentive audience for this past hour, and I appreciate it. Happy Winter Skull, and God bless. <clears throat>
And our friend Walter Pepka uh, engaged uh, another acquaintance of his who owned a marketing firm in Chicago, and there was an incredible marketing effort in the first, in, in spring of 1949. And there's some very, very interesting uh, posters and, and advertisements if you'd be interested in seeing those. Yeah. Comments? I think I see a hand. Oh. You know, this is called Stump the Speaker. I, I almost always get asked this, and I do not know from which two they did not come. I'll bet you they're here right now, though, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Again, persistence. Elizabeth said to Walter, you know who ought to come to this thing? Albert Schweitzer. Walter said, I like that idea. He called Robert Hutchins and said, Hutchins, get Schweitzer. <laughs> Robert Hutchins said, uh, not so fast. He doesn't even attend conferences at the Albert Schweitzer Foundation. Walter said, well, ask him anyway. And I think they got either one or two no's from Schweitzer. And then the, the official story, which I think there has to be more to it, is that Pepka offered to make uh, a fairly modest donation for medicine to, uh, for Schweitzer's hospital in Africa. He, he offered a $5,000 contribution to the hospital. Um, I believe there must have been some other arm twisting. I also like to believe that Schweitzer recognized um, how important it was in 1949 for the world to pause and reflect on what Goethe had to say. Anyway, I believe my time is up. Uh, once again, happy Winter Skull. I hope you enjoy all the other events. And really, thanks for coming, and thanks for helping me keep the Aspen idea alive. <laughs> <laughs>